It's hard to believe that once I was captivated with this game called Bruce Lee, which I used to play on a portable Commodore in my local computer store. Not because I liked the story, but because I was able to fly and kick a ninja and curious to progress through various challenges. If it wasn't for the description on the casing, I wouldn't even know it had a story. However, through the advancement of technology, games are now looking more lively than ever. With graphics and animations that are increasingly harder to distinguish from reality, also comes a growing desire for better storytelling, to make those worlds more believable. But with that development, I wonder if stories in games can ever be more effective as their passive counterparts, like books and film. This is Upgrading Open World Games. A series that explores how current developments in game design and technology could improve the open world games of the future. In each video I'll be focusing on only one design aspect. And this time it's upgrading story in open world games. Contrary to the more traditional approach of writing a book or screenplay, is that stories in games are not everything. Game development does not start by crafting a narrative structure that has wonderful words and sentences. But it's the art of creating a harmonious relationship between the equally important triangle of presentation, gameplay and narrative. Narratively, those experiences are arranged in either a linear or non-linear order. In open worlds it's usually both, with the main narrative that unfolds through dedicated story objectives, chronologically adding new tasks to the map after each completed quest in which all players get to do the same thing, in the same order, having the same consequences. But there are also the optional stories, side quests that aren't required to proceed. So the non-linearity of an open world is the way you decide to play or skip all of the available stories. This complex structure of interwoven stories gave birth to the profession of narrative designer. A fancy word for craftspeople that have technical understanding of how all involved elements are balanced and use it as an opportunity to improve the game's story, rather than imposing selfish prose that doesn't work with the mechanics of the game. Because it's the mechanics and not story that make games unique, they are the rules of the virtual world you're inhabiting. And they encompass every moving part of the game. Rules like how you traverse, with whom or what you can interact and how if the environment is destructible, how you can upgrade your character and more. Most of these elements will have an influence on how the story progresses. So it's important that the narrative designer understands all these moving parts to collaborate effectively with animators, level designers, programmers, concept artists and all other creative departments involved in game design. And while games might be the most challenging stage to write great stories for, it is also the medium with the most untapped potential. When do we actually consider any story to be good? Despite of course varying per person as a subjective choice, there is one element in particular that stands out and has some coherence to it, which is the structure of a story. In 1949, mythology professor Joseph Campbell published his book The Hero with a Thousand Faces, in which he popularized the idea that most stories in all mythology, Eastern as well as Western, followed a similar narrative pattern, which he titled The Monomyth. The monomyth is a narrative structure of several stages that amount to a beginning, the setup, the middle, confrontations and end, the resolution of stories. Although the earliest mention of this structure came from Greek philosopher Aristotle, Campbell is praised for highlighting the parallels of stories across various cultures. And by doing so he developed a starting point embraced by popular writers of books and screenplays alike. In short, it can be described as the arc of conflict and change, like a protagonist who leaves his or her familiar life behind to adventure into unknown territory and face the challenges that come with that, before resolving the goal and returning as a changed person. Sounds familiar? Well, that's because the core idea is still found in most genres. A great illustration is the series Community, that has parodied just about every pop culture genre producing very diverse episodes while still being about the mishaps of a study group in their college. An episode could be based on a courtroom drama, heroic action, and everything in between. Even documentary. They knocked it down. But what's similar in all of these episodes is the structure of their story. Writer Dan Harmon developed his own modernized version of the monomyth with eight story beats that he uses for all his screenplays. According to Harmon, if a story doesn't fit his story's circle, it's never good enough, whatever the genre. 
Now this is not to say that the monomyth and all its adaptions is the formula for every good story. To follow its structure with cliché characters and an uninteresting theme still make for a bland experience. But it's remarkable how little the story structure part has changed throughout history, if you compare it to style for example. Even with all the updated variations and reinterpretations of Joseph Campbell's work, all the stories you consider to be your favorites will probably have more in common with the structure of the monomyth than you would like to believe. And what's most interesting to me is what it reveals about being human. Apparently there's something genetic within us that feels aligned to the fundamental structure of this arc. Maybe because it's the cliché of our psychological development, overcoming hurdles to fulfill some self-invented destiny. So no wonder the monomyth was also used to add more complex stories to games, better fitted with the rapid evolution of its visuals and mechanics. But the question is, does it translate well? Let's look at the game Journey. The developers of Journey used the monomyth as one of its main inspirations, and it stands out in how they effectively adapted its narrative structure to a different medium. By not relying on the standard approach of using dialogue and cutscenes to create drama, but understanding that the emotional experience of playing games is just very different. In games you're engaged, instead of just being a voyeur along for the ride, you perform and accomplish things. In the case of Journey, using the monomyth arc as an abstraction to provoke a sense of mystery, awe and connection that couldn't be reproduced by any passive media. But Journey also presents some limitations of using the monomyth to tell stories in games. You could argue that the game lacks compelling gameplay. The problem is that games in essence are built around the idea of repeated behavior. If the game teaches me that I can jump by pressing X, chances are that I'll have to do that frequently. An important task of game design is how to make the core gameplay mechanics evolve, so that pressing the jump button is still fun to do when the story nears its end. More mechanics means complexer games, because all these mechanics would need a similar evolutionary arc to keep them entertaining, requiring segments that will also influence the story. Mechanics are by design the opposite of story structure. They consist of repetitions that films or books will avoid like the plague. Because having a protagonist that's doing the same thing in every scene is not advancing the story. It's why Journey deliberately kept its controls minimalistic, affected only by the environments you crossed and having all sorts of ways to upgrade your character. Most of what you do involves sliding down hills, navigating towards glowing symbols to extend your scarf. Enabling you to jump further when recharged by floating flags that are conveniently scattered. Or communicating in a fictional language to access new areas. To add more mechanics to that loop would have only been a distraction from the narrative meaning. Then to rely too much on the monument in games can result in conflicting effects, since the traditional story tentpoles usually stand in the way of a more gameplay focused experience. And because it's an interactive medium, there's also the aspiration for choice. A game rather presents various mediocre endings, instead of just writing the best possible story for that game, if it's in service of better gameplay and more agency. So the challenge for having better stories in games to this day still seems unchanged. It's how to blend that primal desire for traditional story structures within an interactive medium that promises player agency, without getting in the way of the gameplay experience and trigger emotions in ways only games can do. If you disassemble every story used in a game down to its most basic structure, there are only two narrative approaches. It is either scripted or emergent. Scripted is everything that's pre-authored, so it includes non-linear narrative as well. Games with a branching storyline and options and dialogue to send you on different paths with different endings are still scripted. They're just very complex scripts. But emergent narrative is never pre-constructed. Its stories aren't predetermined by the designer, but shaped through the interconnected gameplay systems of the game itself. More on that later. Now the purpose of this video is not about what are the best stories these two approaches have yielded, because that's too subjective. I'm more interested in what the most effective techniques are within scripted and emergent stories to convey a unique emotional experience that could improve the quality of stories in games and keep pushing its boundaries. And scripted is our default expectation when thinking about story. 
an authored adventure with enough diversity to keep us invested till the end. Just like in passive media, but now with agency and the added possibility of having a non-linear experience. As Journey has shown, it's not by emulating everything we know from films and books to have the most effective story in games. It's by understanding that games don't convey emotions in the same way. But by staying loyal to the structure of the monomyth, it was also pretty shallow in terms of gameplay. Now take Shadow of the Colossus. Its premise is the story cliché of a video game. A young adventurer strikes a deal with an entity to resurrect a girl and needs to defeat 16 mythical colossi to have his wish fulfilled. Pretty old school save the princess kind of video game stuff, that is nothing compelling to start with. But rather than turning it into a power fantasy cliché, with some insane backstory that justifies the slaying of these giant creatures to save the world, designer Fumito Ueda chose to reverse those expected tropes and confront the player's actions by letting them feel different emotions. Like loneliness, companionship, sacrifice and remorse. Although you're seeing footage of the beautifully remade version from 2018, I'd have to say that the graphical and memory limitations of the first release could have well been the cause of its story. Instead of making a game to fit a narrative, he worked with the constraints, adapting the story to what's technically possible with the hardware at that time. The difference with Journey is that by letting go of the monomyth, it's more free in its use of gameplay mechanics, sticking to a more classical loop of combat, traversal and exploration, but giving them a theme without abandoning the possibility to explore emotions so rarely used well in games. It's a game that has spent three generations of consoles for a reason, and because of its mystery, it's still being debated for its meaning due to the space it leaves open for players to fill in the gaps. But what both Journey and Shadow of the Colossus miss is what might be expected most of an interactive medium, and that's choice. In Shadow of the Colossus you don't get to choose the faith of your opponents. To know how it all ends, you have to be complicit in defeating the Colossi. But for good reason. To add choice would have quantified the design complexity, needing more gameplay elements to present an equally interesting alternate path. So games that want choice run the risk of becoming worse because they are much harder to balance, leading to moralistically superficial games with shallow choices that are either good or evil. Making choices meaningful and work well remains one of the big challenges of game design and is still being approached from many different angles. I like how 11-bit studios dealt with this, with games like Frostpunk and this War of Mine. In both games you're tasked to keep the survivors of a catastrophic event alive by making difficult choices that will always have severe costs. Like do you legalize child labor to have more manpower, or risk casualties from exhaustion by forcing 24 hour shifts, just to get the resources necessary to survive? Do you steal food and medicines from an elderly couple to heal a friend, knowing these people will probably die because of it? There's a downside to all of these choices, and not one of them guarantees success. It's how they will eventually add up that determines the outcome. There's no good or bad way to play these games, no winning scenario. It's about survival and minimizing loss when winning is impossible, and letting you deal with the consequences of those morally reprehensible choices. And that's a way of storytelling that can only be done in games. What makes games unique as well is that you can be an explorer. This has led to a different approach within scripted storytelling that deserves its own category. Although passive media is filled with subtext carefully hidden in plain sight, like the meaning of crosses in The Departed, or the seatbelt metaphor in Jurassic Park, allowing the viewer the chance to predict the story, it will always be the cast that will tie it all together to see if those assumptions are right. But in games you're the one driving the story by taking action, which can be done in more ways than just selecting quests from a list. The most basic example of environmental storytelling can be found in every space, where just looking around already gives an impression of its history and the things that might have happened. There's a lot to assume about what type of personality is living here, or who lives here. In open worlds, exploring these spaces usually reward you with items, like an audio log or collectible to add some backstory. But more often than not, it can feel as a cheap way of exposition without interesting gameplay, like exploring an environment to find an item that triggers a cutscene explaining everything you see. What? Environmental storytelling done well functions more like a puzzle, 
Stories that are hidden in the game's world to be pieced together by the player after the fact, like an investigative journalist would. And they're characterized by a number of important components. The first is that the story is presented as fragments, not as one specific file with a beginning, middle and an end, but as pieces of a puzzle that will only make sense once they are stitched together by the player. Take the coma, in which you are assigned to retrieve AI data from an abandoned space station, but free to explore the scattered details to find out what exactly happened. The scenes in Tacoma are a collection of the crew's interactions, played back as augmented reality recordings, but each AR scene alone gives you partial information. Before it all makes sense, you have to connect it to items found and other scenes. The second component is that the order of finding all the pieces of the story is not predetermined. Players will make connections on their own terms, and the experience of discovering the story will be different for everyone. Just relying on what you hear in an AR scene won't be a truthful representation of information. The exploration of found items can give new context to that exchange, and when you miss some, your interpretation will be different. The third component is that you at least have one dedicated mechanic you use to piece the story together, making it more than just pressing a button to start an audio diary. In Tacoma, it's scrubbing through AR recordings to find information and cross-referencing them with found items. The fourth component is that the unraveled story should give more insight into the game's world. And it's even better when it's able to change your perspective of it, shining a new light on what you've already encountered. Once you leave the space station, you will know a lot more than just what happened. An observant player will also understand the politics of the game's world and how it shaped the personalities of the crew. These components all combined is not something I've come across in AAA games yet. And that's a shame, because they can result in very different experiences. Take Outer Wilds, or Her Story, at first sight not games you expect to have any similarities. But both use their own unique variations of these four components. In AAA the closest examples are Miyazaki's games, that have a rich world as optional layers to be explored. You have to combine the fragments of information retrieved from conversations, item descriptions and paying close attention to the environment if you want the full picture. It's a more subtle way of revealing story through gameplay that can be ignored altogether if preferred. Contrary to the more elaborate use of cutscenes to explain everything, it makes the stories of these games have way more to tell than what's revealed on the surface. But the most ambitious development of storytelling in games remains Emergent stories are created by the interconnected mechanics of the game itself. Systems that react to what a player does, instead of what players are expected to do. However, before I explain in more detail, it's important to make a distinction here between emergent gameplay and emergent narrative. Because emergent gameplay can still exist within scripted stories, like in Dishonored, that has a large variety of tactics you can use to complete any mission which path to take, with what skills, and the world changing accordingly to those actions. If you play stealthy and don't spill too much blood, keeping the city as neat as possible, the story will eventually conclude with the low chaos ending. But if you choose to eliminate the majority of whoever gets in your way and kill more than 50% of the population, the quantity of reds will increase, unlocking the high chaos ending. But this is not emergent narrative, it's emergent gameplay, because the way you play will still fit within one of the predetermined outcomes. Emergent narrative is something you can experience in EVE Online, a game in which players are role-playing a self-selected part in an unscripted virtual space economy. You can be whatever you like, an explorer, a pirate, a trader or more and form alliances to wage wars for territorial control and economic dominance. The developer designed the setting, supplied the mechanics and rules on how to interact. But the history defining the EVE Online universe is written by the actions of players, and not by following some designed missions to further the story. All names and events are initiated by the community itself, none of it scripted by developers, but emergent stories shaped by the goals that players have and the tools at their disposal. Stories that can be replayed and are added to the ongoing historical timeline of the EVE Online universe, whatever the outcome of the incident. The problem with multiplayer, however, is that the roles players inhabit are often fairly one-sided, lacking the variety of real-world citizens, 
The most popular stories of EVE Online's universe are usually rooted in someone's loss for power, containing some kind of scam or betrayal, and rarely about players who do good. It can be quite a frustrating experience for new players venturing into this universe, having to deal with all that toxicity, getting shot out of space all too often by those who have invested way more time into the game, gathering material and financial wealth to display their power, only because they can. Non-playable characters could add the diversity of personalities. NPCs that stay more true to a role relating to the game's world, than mostly having players expressing predictable power fantasies. Because the greater the diversity of personalities, the more types of stories there are possible. But those NPCs need to be able to learn from your actions and adapt to how they can affect the world. NPCs that aren't always in agreement with the choices you make creating dynamic responses that for instance could flip loyalty and broaden the possibilities of interaction in more human-like fashion. And the best examples of this can be found in the real-time strategy genre, where this type of AI is mostly explored. Take Crusader Kings 3, in which you get to select one noble of a specific region and control their line of heirs by the choices you make during centuries of history. It's about choosing ambitions, who to marry, what title to gain, and building relationships with NPCs that can help achieve those goals. A simulation of interactions between hundreds of nobles on the map, each with their own personality, defined by traits and lifestyle that drive their behavior. For example, if the opinion of my council spymaster is negative, he's more susceptible to scheme against me if he likes my rifles better. But a simple gift will make it less likely to happen. It does a credible job of generating emergent stories formed by the interactions you have with a large variety of personalities. You could derail history and conquer Europe with an Irish family if you like, or try to expand territory with diplomacy, only to have it ruined by rifling sons. It's the game that probably fits closest to the original promise of Game of Thrones, in which nothing is certain. Not focusing on the arc of one protagonist on a heroic journey, but on stories generated by a shared goal. The pursuit of the Iron Throne by many different players and how it affects their world. It's part of a larger timeline on which some of the main characters only play a temporary role. A systemic way of storytelling that replaces the pre-constructed branching narratives with limitless procedurally generated stories. Shaped by the ever-changing relationships of NPCs that act independently and player choice. In this world nobody is safe. Just like in Game of Thrones, interesting characters can die unexpectedly and justice not always prevails, which brought some very interesting dynamics to the series, before it reverted to the more classical approach of storytelling to conclude it all. In that regard, Crusader Kings might even be proof that games could be a more suitable medium for this kind of storytelling, because it allows for many different endings based on how player inputs affect the dynamics of the world, instead of having one ending that leaves everyone satisfied. Now strategy games are not to everyone's liking. They're usually dense, with lots of menus and visually not that interesting. Most of it is taking place on a map and the action plays out as text on screen or as simple animations. So there's a lot left to the imagination of the player. Nevertheless, the groundwork of how it could be translated to the more visual spectacle of an open world is also present. Shadow of Mordor and its sequel Shadow of War have the Nemesis system. It uses procedural generation to determine the appearance and behavior of enemies. Enemies that are shaped algorithmically from a large palette of visual assets, audio lines and traits to create a unique cast of characters for every player. Characters that will each have their own history written by the encounters of systemically generated events. Now these events tie into the main scripted story as well. In Shadow of War, the goal is to build an army to defeat Sauron. And part of it is dominating suitable candidates to join you in battle. These become the emergent sub-stories that are unique for every player, and unknown to the developer through the design of the system. No player will encounter the same orc and have the same history. And even though these stories are shallow, ultra-violent, and never referenced in the main story, they are already far more memorable than most of what's scripted. I, for example, had greater affection for the insignificant history of this poor chap named Nuruk Gortide than any of the scripted personalities, because he heroically intervened while I was beating up his blood brother Gubu, loyalty that only dug his own grave as Nuruk failed to prevent Gubu from getting recruited by me 
With Gubu now fighting the brother that came to his rescue, I retired Nuro Gortite's short-lived career with ease, erasing him from my personal history book of Mordor, unlike the orcs that are now defending the castles I conquered with them. It's just one example of the endless possibilities of true butterfly effect stories that no one can recreate in entirety. Names and looks will be different, as will your history, with each of those personalities. What emergent gameplay could also allow is a more interesting way of handling themes and politics. One issue that is holding back the improvement of stories in AAA games is that a lot of big publishers are not willing to take a stance on what their game is trying to tell. Even when it's all too obvious that it's heavily inspired by problematic real-world issues. Take out Deus Ex Mankind Divided named the struggle between its augmented citizens and humans a mechanical apartheid which is a clear reference to South Africa's racial segregation history, and also using an Ox Life Matter sign as promotional art, yet stating it's nothing but an unfortunate coincidence of having any resemblance with the Black Lives Matter activists that campaign against ongoing systemic racism. A rather poor response, that implies they haven't even done proper research on the subject matter of racial segregation, only using it as a style element to shock and trigger some brainless action with player choice as shallow social commentary on a far more complex problem. Games like Far Cry 5 or Detroit Become Human have comparable issues. Games that present choices by oversimplifying the issues they are clearly influenced by, yet hiding behind the cliché that it's up to the player to derive any meaning from it thus avoiding any controversy and appeal to the largest possible audience. But this approach won't elevate storytelling in games. At worst, it distastefully capitalizes on challenging issues. At best, it's a moralistic outdated story cliché of good versus evil that does a bad job of emulating the complexity of the real thing, only enlarging the disconnect the more realistic the game looks. To make storytelling relevant in any medium, it must at least have something to say presenting some new perspective on a certain theme or topic. Like how Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice uses the plot of having to save the soul of a dead lover as an effective metaphor about dealing with psychosis. Or how the surreal story of Kentucky Route Zero about a truck driver named Conway making a final delivery is actually about the American recession and the politics of death, both turning them into way more interesting games by using its themes as part of their design. Movies, series and books are just stories. But games are an experience in which story is connected to the gameplay mechanics. Meaningful storytelling has to be weaved in and more than in any other medium. This means that the advancements in technology, like the creation of a new gameplay mechanic or a new engine release, could also alter the possibilities of ways to tell stories. And if you look at the evolution of stories in games, there seems to be a slow shift from the scripted experience to stories that have to be discovered, revealing more about the game's world and its characters through exploration, and the latest emergent approach that makes the player a collaborator in creating them. It's not that the future will be a shift in styles, but a merger of what the best of these three approaches will bring with that last emergent approach only just touching the surface in open worlds and having the greatest potential for innovation. I'd like to compare this with sports, because in sports anything is possible. Despite that there will always be favorites, there are also surprises due to the large amount of elements that can all have their influence on the outcome. Any match can twist and turn into a very different story than predicted by the experts in advance. It can involve hope, tension, drama and exhilaration in whatever order in ways that rarely follow the set structure of a monomyth. It works just like how an emergent game story is the result of the way mechanics interact with each other. There's a statistical prediction in what these encounters can result, but all involved elements can influence that outcome. How you interact with an NPC, how those interactions influence the world, and how you respond to its changes can lead to limitless story outcomes. What if, for example, the game's story is not the timeline of a character, but of goals within a dynamic world that can be pursued by more NPCs, generating multiple stories linked to the roles you choose. Maybe shifting from the action approach of dominating opponents to join your cause, to convincing them diplomatically in a more conversational gameplay setting. Now the most important component to achieve this will have to come from the innovations within AI. If stories become more emergent, the challenge then is 
What kind of AI do NPCs need to match well-written personalities with depth that can produce good stories? Because the player's interactions with those NPCs now become the foundation of how those stories are written. To have AI that goes beyond only serving as an opponent or a companion and could be both. Offering solutions to problems that don't always have to end up in combat. Once that starts to happen in believable ways, open worlds can definitely become the platform that could innovate the art of storytelling in general. Because the stories that will come from them will at least surprise us, perhaps making us feel different emotions than those traditional structures we are now all too familiar with. My next video will be about character depth. Because before I explore the challenges of adding more complex AI into NPCs, we should look at what makes characters compelling in the first place. The current lack of interesting characters in games is not without reason, and another important cause of bad stories in games. But how can deeper characters translate to compelling gameplay and tell better stories, without alienating the player? That's next time. Meanwhile use the comments to share how you think stories will improve in open world games. And if you are interested in following this series, subscribe and click the bell to be notified when new videos are online.